Okay, so welcome everyone to the CVS lecture by Dr. Hyderi for step one. Thank you so much for going to class. Hope you guys are doing well. If you guys can hear my voice, can I get a yes in the chat box, please? Very good, thank you so much. And uh, we apologize for starting the lecture half an hour later. Today, due to some unavoidable circumstances, I hope you guys understand. Um, before I begin, can I just ask you over here very quickly, do you guys get the daily recordings and the daily links on time? Yes or no? Is everyone receiving their recording? Okay, good. Um, is anyone over here, uh, friend of Dr. Hagar, anyone with the name of Dr. Hagar or a friend of Dr. Hagar, can you please say yes? Okay, good. Okay, Dr. Ethan, thank you so much for helping us out. Um, so uh, we received an email in the morning regarding the fact that uh, she or he has, is not receiving the lecture recordings on time. Uh, we have been sending them out. And thank you so much for sending it out yourself. Uh, do you have any idea if she's going to join the class or if she's or if she is um, or if she's planning on only receiving the recordings? Is she going to join the class or uh, is she? I'm not sure if it's a he or if she, she wants to join. Okay. So we sent her the lecture link. I'm not sure why she's not receiving it. Okay, so we sent her the link and um, she should receive the lecture link. If you want, I can just send it back one more time. You can just give me a quick second. Can I share it? Of course. Yes, you can share it, no problem. Okay, so that's that. Now, thank you so much for joining the class, the rest of you guys. And uh, while we wait for the other students to come and join, can we do a quick revision and recapitulation of the topics from yesterday? Yes or no? Yes? Okay, good. So um, yesterday we talked about a lot of different types of things. Did you guys get some chance to go through the first date by yourself? First question. Okay. Does everything uh, make more sense when you went through the text by yourself? Yes or no? Or do you guys have any questions? Okay, so let's begin. Um, can you tell me what are the murmurs that will increase with Valsalva maneuver? Can anyone tell me what murmurs will increase with Valsalva maneuver? Very good, thank you so much, Dr. Christine Holcomb. And? And? Michael Valsalva, very good. What are some of the murmurs that will increase with squatting, passive leg raise, and hand grip? What are some of the murmurs that will increase with? Very good. That will increase, that will increase with squatting, passive leg raise, hand grip. AR, MR, BSD. Okay, very good. Um, then what else? Over here, uh, what are some of the murmurs that will increase with um, inspiration? Uh, 
Okay, Doc, uh, do we have a question? Valsalva maneuver increases preload, so Holcom should decrease. Uh, Valsalva maneuver, if it increases preload, then what happens? Okay, let me tell you over here. Like who else thinks that uh, Valsalva maneuver should increase the Holcom murmur? Does anyone have this confusion? Guys, Valsalva maneuver. Will Valsalva maneuver, I, I mean, will Valsalva maneuver, um, Valsalva maneuver increases preload. Valsalva maneuver does not increase preload. That's the, that's the thing. And I got confused, my apologies. Valsalva maneuver will decrease preload. It's not gonna increase preload. Can you please check your text one more time, Dr. Uh, S, if you wouldn't mind. Valsalva maneuver will prevent the entry of blood into the heart because of the increased intrathoracic act, increased inter intrathoracic pressure. Can I get some feedback from you guys very quickly? Will Valsalva maneuver increase preload or decrease preload? Fast questions. Valsalva maneuver will decrease preload. If Valsalva maneuver, uh, you saw it in U World, yes. Valsalva maneuver yesterday, do you remember that there are two phases? In the strain phase, in the straining phase of Valsalva maneuver, the, the preload will decrease. And then in the relaxation phase, preload will increase. Okay, is, it clear? is that clear now? Okay, good. Good, thank you. So Dr. S, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. And uh, once again, everyone, um, please try to understand that Valsalva maneuver has two phases, uh, straining phase and then a let go phase. In the straining phase, the um, preload is going to increase. And I mean, the preload is going to do decrease. If it decreases, then the murmur of Holcomb is going to increase. Okay, good. Are we clear, yes or no? <clears throat> Everyone? Yes, okay. Do we have Dr. Hagar with us today, yes or no? Dr. Hagar, do, do we have Dr. Hagar? Yes, in relaxation phase, preload increases. Preload increases. Okay, yes. Uh, can I get the attention of Dr. Hagar over here very quickly, if you, if you wouldn't mind? Or friend of Dr. Hagar? Yes, thank you so much for joining the class. I'm not sure why you did not receive the Zoom link yesterday, but we sent it out at 12.27 a.m. to um, your email address. Is this your email address? I just want to make sure. Do you, uh, in, in my screen, do you see my screen over here? In my screen, does this look like your email address or is this the correct email address? Yes, okay. And you still did not receive the Zoom link. I, I just wanna make sure if there's anything wrong from my end. Can I get some quick answers, please? Is this the correct email address? Is this the email address where I should be sending the lecture links today or should I use another different email address? Okay. Can I get some feedback, please? Yes, okay. I think there could be something wrong on your end. If you want, you can send us another email address and then we will use that email address to send you your Zoom link. But uh, since you have completed your transaction, uh, we have been sending you the we have been sending you the Zoom link and I'm not sure why you're not receiving it. We're also sending you the uh, lecture recording. You know? So um, if there's something wrong on your end, and please let us know if you want to update your email address and send us another one, we'll be more than happy to uh, help you out with the, with the new email address. 
Okay. Are we clear, everyone? Um, do you guys have any other questions for me today, or should I just begin with uh, pathology? Quick, quick question. Recording will be available till end of lectures, or no? Recording will not be available. Will not be available till the end of the lectures. You guys have to download the recordings when you get the links for the recordings. Is everyone aware of this information that when you guys get the links for the recordings, you have to download the recordings? Yes or no? Hey, Dr. V, you did not receive your um, lecture recording. Okay, let me see why. Okay, give me one second. Isn't this your email address, Dr. BK? Yes or no? Yes, so uh, I'm not really sure why you're not receiving it. Is there something wrong with uh, your email or can you please check one more time? Because we sent it out at 5.43 p.m. yesterday. Okay. So if you have not received it, please let me know or please update us with another new email address and uh, we'll send it out. Okay. Everyone else, are you guys receiving your links and your recordings on time? Yes or no? Because I just want to make sure uh, if there's anything wrong from our end so that we can update the system and make sure that this doesn't happen. Okay, so whenever you guys have difficulties receiving the links, or receiving the email address uh, or receiving the lecture recordings, you can contact us anytime, as soon as possible, send us an email and we'll get back to you. And there's another alternative. The alternative is all you have to do is if you're in the Facebook discussion group over here, in the Facebook discussion group, then over here, you will receive the email, uh, the lecture links every day, okay? You will, you will not receive the recordings, you will only receive the lecture links over here, okay? That's it. So uh, without further ado, are we ready to begin the pathology? Uh, does anyone have any other question? Dr. S had some questions from UWorld. What was your question, Dr. S? It was about radius. Okay, so please take a picture or snapshot of the question and post it uh in the facebook discussion group if you're over here and then i'll discuss it or if you want to bring it up at the end of the lecture then you're more than welcome to okay are we clear okay thank you so much and thank you so much dr s for actively doing questions and actively uh solving the questions and coming up with problems so that you can um so that you can uh, bring it up in the class and discuss it with the rest of us we really appreciate it okay so today, since we have lost quite a little bit of time due to the um, late onset of the lecture itself and everything else, so I just want to jump straight right into the pathology. Okay. One more question. How many of us have completed the homework from yesterday? Fast answers, please. How many of us have completed the homework from yesterday? Hey, Dr. Ellen, thank you so much. Who else is doing their homework? Dr. V, very good. Dr. Tasneem, thank you so much. Dr. S, I know you did your homework because you have questions from URL. Dr. Otero, thank you so much. Okay, rest of you guys, please make sure that you do your homework at in the same day. Okay, good. So let's begin with the cardiovascular system, the cardiovascular pathology. Okay, the cardiovascular pathology, is everyone ready? Yes or no, one last time. Is everyone ready for cardiovascular pathology? Yes, okay, let's begin. So as you can see, the cardiovascular pathology over here, they begin with the discussions of congenital heart diseases, right? So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about the congenital heart disease and then we'll eventually move forward. Okay, we'll eventually move forward. Now let's start with uh, congenital heart, heart, heart disease. When we talk about congenital heart disease, we have basically two types. One is cyanotic, another one is a cyanotic. So that's basically what it is. 
So whenever we say cyanotic heart disease, okay, this is very easy to remember. When we say cyanotic heart disease, what do we mean? So we basically mean when we say the when we say cyanosis, okay, when we say cyanosis, what do we mean? Do we are we expecting that the shunt is from right to left or from left to right? The answer is we are expecting that if the congenital heart disease is associated with cyanosis, the shunt is the, the shunt is usually left to right or, or right to left. Fast answer, please. Okay, the shunt is usually. Okay, so we have so many answers. We have right to left, left to right. Okay. So over here, the shunt is very simple. It's very simple to understand that you guys will not make the same mistake again once you understand this concept. Okay, look at this. Once you understand this concept, you will not make the same mistake again. The concept is very simple. Okay, this is the right side. This is the left side. The right side has deoxygenated blood. The left side has oxygenated blood. Um, if the blood reaches the systemic circulation, right? If the blood, if they reach the systemic circulation from the right side to the left side, that is the deoxygenated blood is, is going to the right side to the left side, then we will get cyanotic heart disease cyanotic congenital heart disease. That makes sense because the, because the blood on the right side is deoxygenated and the blood on the left side is oxygenated. Okay. So to be more precise, cyanotic congenital heart disease, the shunt is from right to left and this results in what we say as a early cyanosis. Why do we say early cyanosis? Okay. Um, the reason why we say early cyanosis is that initially what's happening, initially what's happening is that the blood is shifting from the right to left, okay? And as a result, when blood shifts from right to left to any of the shunts, then the blood goes from the left ventricle to the aorta and they go to the systemic circulation, resulting in the presence of more deoxygenated blood than oxygenated blood. So we get cyanosis. Another thing is at one point, all this blood on the left side, will it push back on the right side? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. Yes. When all the blood from the left side pushes back on the right side, because of what? Because of the high pressure on the left side of the heart, then there could be, there, there could be a fixation or decreased cyanosis due to the shunt. Have I made myself clear? Because the blood on the left side is oxygenated okay so oxygenated so that's it so if there's a child who comes to you with some sort of a murmur right if there's a child who comes to you with some sort of a murmur and the child displays sign symptoms of getting cyanosis are you going to expect right to left or left to right shunt fast answer please the answer is you are going to expect what type of a shunt right to left shunt okay can anyone explain very quickly why why can anyone explain very quickly why? Why? Why do we get cyanosis from the right to left? Okay, you don't have to explain. Have you understood why? You do not have to explain. Have you understood why? Deoxygenated blood to oxygenated blood. Okay. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. So when we talk about cyanotic heart diseases, okay, when we talk about cyanotic heart disease, we think about five T's, okay? We think about five T's, very simple. We have the T's in one, two, three, four, and five. So we talked about five T's. So number one is one T, one T, only one. Only one, this should make you remember that 
there's only one trunk that fails to divide into two separate blood vessels. What is the name of this pathology? I need some fast answers today, if you guys want to finish. I need some fast feedbacks from you guys. Dr. Ellen, thank you so much. Dr. Choudhury, thank you so much. This is truncus arteriosus. Okay, next one, two. Two is one vessel <coughs> arising from a different location, another vessel arising from another different location. For example, the aorta is uh, arising from the right ventricle and the pulmonary blood vessel arising from the left ventricle. This disease is very good. Transposition of great vessels. Number three, three, four, three, four, um, three, four, the trivalvular shape of the right side of the heart which undergoes agenesis. This is very good. P4, tricuspid atresia, meaning absence of tricuspid valve. Okay, four, 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 four problems, right ventricular hypertrophy, ventricular septal defect, overriding of the aorta and pulmonary stenosis. This is tautology of, hello, very easy to understand. Number five is total, Anomalous pulmonary venous stenosis. Total anomalous pulmonary venous return or venous drainage. P A T D R. <coughs> These are five letters. Okay, so that's it. Are we clear? Yes or no? Oh, good. So, from where will you receive your questions, and how are you going to do this? Now, always remember that first and foremost, in order for you to understand and uh, answer the right question all the time, you have to know the clinical features of each of these conditions. If you do not know the clinical features, for example, how will you receive the question? In your question, they'll talk about a young patient who comes to you with, for example, sign symptoms of fatigue, lethargy, unable, to feed, okay, unable to feed. For example, if a baby is, uh, ha if the baby has a shunt where he or she has a lot of deoxygenated blood, um, will he or she have enough energy to, uh, to undergo the process of breastfeeding? Yes or no? The answer is no. Okay, very simple. So the baby will be fatigued, the baby will be lethargic, the baby will not be able to feed properly. Obviously, the baby will have some sort of a murmur. The baby will have cyanosis. Okay, and then these are some of the general sign symptoms of a congenital heart disease, right? And uh, the babies, they can also have upper respiratory tract infections and different, and, uh, different other things. Now, when you combine all of these with a murmur that has a continuous machine murmur, what is your diagnosis? Continuous machine-like murmur, very good. Your diagnosis is PDA, okay, good. So this shows that you guys are doing your homework and thank you so much, okay? Because we wanna make sure that right by the time we are done with our lecture, you guys are done with your first revision of first thing. So this is persistent inductus uh, arteriosus. Then, 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 then what else? For example, if I say that, for example, uh, over here in persistent ductus arteriosus, right? Persistent ductus arteriosus. This is basically an acyanotic heart disease. So cyanosis could or could not be there, more or less. Okay. But what if I tell you that? A patient comes to you with fatigue, lethargy, unable to feed, murmur, and cyanosis. My, my apologies. And cyanosis. And the murmur is a hollow systolic murmur at the left third intercostal space along the sternal border. What is your diagnosis? Hollow systolic murmur. Very good. Your diagnosis is a BSD. Okay. What if I tell you that there's a patient who comes to you with fatigue, lethargy, unable to feed, murmur, cyanosis, and the patient all of a sudden gets tired when playing and the patient squats down when the patient has difficulty in breathing? What is your diagnosis? Or, 
for example, when the patient um, is under stress, the patient gets very blue. Or we say that the patient undergoes blue spells. Blue spells. What is your diagnosis? Tetralogy of, tetralogy of fallow, right? So this is exactly how we will be doing this. So let's begin with the first one over here, okay? So cyanotic heart disease, let's begin with the first one. The first one is persistent truncus arteriosus. What is persistent truncus arteriosus? This is basically a disease where the truncus arteriosus, right? It fails to divide into pulmonary trunk and aorta. Now, the question, the question is, about a patient who will come to you with sign symptoms of cyanosis, fatigue, lethargy. And then over here, they will uh, tell you that they see that there's a presence of only one trunk. The questions are usually, the, the questions are usually regarding the fact that um, why do we get persistent truncus arteriosus? The answer is due to failure of the aortical pulmonary septum formation. This is extremely high yield, so please underline this. Okay. Are we clear, yes or no? So when the aortical pulmonary septum, right? This is the truncus arteriosus. If the aortical pulmonary septum, if it does not form, for example, it forms like this, and then it spirals. If it does not form, then we will not get the division of the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk. And this failure of division due to the lack of formation of the aortic or pulmonary septum results in persistent truncus arteriosus. Are we clear, yes or no? How will you receive this question and how would you know? For example, if a child comes to you with um, fatigue, lethargy and, and, and unable to feed and cyanosis, are we going to do uh, an echocardiogram? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. The answer is yes. When we do an echocardiogram, can we visualize the truncus arteriosus? The answer is yes. So the question will come like this: that they do um, some sort of they do some some sort of an imaging or an examination where they come up with a diagnosis of truncus arteriosus, and they basically ask you why is the patient suffering from this pathology, and they want you to choose a, this exact line due to failure of aortic pulmonary septum formation. And they want you, you to choose this and that's the correct answer. Are we clear, yes or no? Let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to transposition of great vessels. So what did I just say? The first thing I said was, if there is formation, if there is no formation of the aortic pulmonary septum, we get persistent truncus arteriosus. Then the next thing I said was they spiral. Do you remember this? Yes or no? That they spiral. For example, this thing, they turn around. Since they turn around, this part goes like this and this part comes like this. We get the ascending aorta arising from the left ventricle and the pulmonary blood vessel arising from the right ventricle. If the aortic pulmonary septum, if it does not spiral, can we get the ascending aorta from the right ventricle and the um, pulmonary blood vessel from the left ventricle? The answer is yes. So if the question is regarding the fact that why do we get transposition of great vessels? Why is the ascending aorta arising from the right ventricle and the pulmonary blood vessel arising from the left ventricle? The answer is, due to failure of aortic pulmonary septum to spiral. Please underline this, and this is your question. They want to know the cause, okay? Now, uh, let's talk about this. The aorta, they leave to the right ventricle and pulmonary trunks to the left ventricle. That's okay. Separation of systemic and pulmonary circulation. We understand that. Now, over here, Whenever you find out that the patient has transposition of great vessels, are you aware that there are two separate circulations happening with no connection in between them? Yes or no? For example, over here, what's happening? This is the heart, the right side, left side. From the right side, blood comes out to the ascending aorta and blood enters the right, vent uh, the, the right atrium. From the left ventricle, blood comes out to the pulmonary blood vessels and blood enters into the left atrium. So there's no connection in between these two. So do we have to establish some sort of a connection for the patient to survive, yes or no? The answer is yes. What sort of a connection should we establish? 
we need to make sure that there's a duct that was there at the beginning of life that is ductus arteriosus. We need to make sure that that stays patent so that at least there is some shunt that allows the blood to move from the right side to the left side. So over here, persistent, uh, I mean, transposition of great vessels, if you do not create a shunt, can the patient survive? Yes or no, fast answers please. The answer is no, okay. If they have to survive, then the then the ductus arteriosus has to remain patent, okay? Or we need to make sure that they have other forms of shunt that are patent, at least a BSD, if that's there. This is the only time where having a BSD is uh, appreciated or having a patent forum and ovale is appreciated because we want some sort of a, uh, we want some sort of uh, transmission to happen. So the thing is, next question, are you going to leave the patient like this by keeping them, uh, by keeping the ductus arteriosus patent? Yes or no? The answer is no. So the only reason why we would like to keep the ductus arteriosus patent, how? By giving the patient prostaglandin E2, right? Is to make sure that the patient has enough time to go from the medicine ward to the surgical OT. Are we clear? Yes or no? to give the patient enough time, for example, right after birth, the patient comes to you with these problems, right when you diagnose right when you diagnose transposition of great vessels, you need to make sure that the duct remains patent. And then this gives the patient enough time to shift from the pediatric ward to the surgical OT, and then we do the surgery, okay? Another thing is how do we, there is another very high yield finding. This is called egg on a string appearance, egg on a string appearance on chest X-ray that that's how it looks like. Let me just show you the a very clear picture very quickly. Egg on a string appearance. Okay. This chest X-ray finding is very, very high yield. It's very, very high yield. This is exactly how, for example, if you tie an egg by a string and you keep it in the thoracic ca cavity, this is exactly how this is gonna look like. Okay. This is a depiction of how the heart would look like if there are two separate circulations. Are we clear? Does or does this not look like an egg in, on a string appearance of the X-ray? Fast answers, please. The answer is yes or no. Why does it look like this? Because both of the hearts are dilated. Why? Because they're functioning really hard to push the blood to from the right to left. Are we clear? That's why they undergo mild hypertrophy and they get this egg-like structure, okay? Please do not forget egg on a string appearance. You will be tested on this on step one and step two CK, very, very high yield. And obviously without surgical interven intervention, the most infants will die if you do not go for surgery. Next one is not very high yield. I'm gonna use my blue pen for this. Tricuspid atresia is not very high yield. This is when the tricuspid valves are absent and you have a hypoplastic right ventricle. So the reason why it appears as a hypoplastic right ventricle is if the tricuspid valves are not there, then what happens? If the tricuspid valve, this valve, if it's not here, then what happens is that the atria, they shift downwards, right? So the right heart looks like this and the left heart looks like normal, okay? Over here, do you see that if the tricuspid valve is not there, the atria becomes large, Yes or no, the ventricles become small. Why? Because the atria has to make sure that the blood goes from the right side to the lungs. That's why the atria functions more and the atria grows in size. Are we clear, yes or no? The right ventricle does not have to work a lot. That's why there's atrophy and the right ventricle is hypoplastic. Are we clear about this, yes or no? There is, a, there is absence of tricuspid valve and a, hypo, and a hypoplastic right ventricle. Another thing is if you see another sort of a heart where the tricuspid valve is there, but the tricuspid valve is displaced downwards, what is your diagnosis for this patient? There are two conditions, one where tricuspid valve is not there. Another one is the tricuspid valve is there, but it's displaced downwards. This is Epstein's anomaly, okay? This is? Epstein's anomaly, very good. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Ethar. What happens in Epstein's anomaly and why do we get Epstein's anomaly in the patients? Because of maternal intake of 
what lithium very for bipolar disease for maternal intake of lithium for bipolar disease patients can get Epstein's anomaly. Okay, next one is next one is tetralogy of Hello. And for tetralogy of Hello, we get four problems, and I'm going to give four stars because this is extremely high yield. Okay, the tetralogy of Hello is very very high yield. So let me talk about this over here very quickly. First and foremost. Okay, uh, first and foremost, how will the patient of Tetralogy of Fallot come to you? Patients of Tetralogy of Fallot will come to you with signs in terms of fatigue, lethargy, unable to feed, or everything's okay. All of a sudden, they get this sort of spells. What are those spells? The spells is that what, what happens is patients get two, type of, two types of spells. One is a blue spell. Another one is a tet spell. Okay. So what happens is, why do we get blue spells? Blue spells are when a lot of cyanotic blood are entering into the systemic circulation. This is very easy to understand. So patients become severely cyanotic. Patients become severely cyanotic. What is TET spell? TET spell is when the infant with tetralogy of flow, when they cry, right? When they, when they cry, what happens? Do they take a, lar a deep breath in? Yes or no? When they cry, fast answers, please. Yes, when you cry, you take a deep breath in. We all know what happens. When you take a deep breath in, what happens to the intrathoracic pressure? Does it become negative, yes or no? The answer is yes. For example, in inspiration, the intrathoracic pressure becomes negative. As a result, a lot of blood comes to the right side of the heart, yes or no? The answer is yes. So a lot of blood comes to the right side of the heart. And if there are presence of shunts, for example, VSD, will a lot of cyanotic blood go from the right side to the left side, yes or no? The answer is yes. As a result, should there be exaggeration of the cyanosis? Fast answers, please. Only yes or no answers. The answer is yes. Okay, so very easy to understand. Blue spells and pet spells. That's number one. That's how you have to identify your patients in the question stem. Next one is the next common question they ask you regarding this is, what is the pathology? Why do we get the pathology of flow? The answer is very simple. The answer is due to a displacement of the infundibular septum. What, what uh, structures arise from the infundibular septum? Do, do you guys remember what structures arise from the infundibular, infundibular septum? We talked about this. Can anyone tell me? Infundibular septum. Anyone? Okay. What if I tell you that the infundibular septum is... Um, directly related and it's formed with the endocardial cushion. Then what are the structures that are developed from the endocardial cushion? We have the very good. We have the valves and the we have the valves and what else? We have the interventric interventricular and the interatrial septa. So over here, in fundibular septum, Right In fundibular septum, what happens is that during early development, if there's a displacement of the, in, of the um, in fundibular septum, the displacement is anterior and antero superior displacement. Antero superior displacement of in fundibular septum. Okay of the infundibular septum. When there is an anterior superior displacement of the infundibular septum, we get a couple of problems. What are the problems? The problems are, number one, let me talk about this very quickly because this is very high yield. What's happening? Okay. First and foremost, what, what is the number one problem? If anyone has to ask you, out of the four issues we get in Tetralogy of Fellow, pulmonary stenosis, uh, right ventricular hypertrophy, ventricular septal defect, and overriding aorta. Which one is the most high yield or which one is the most common? Very good, Dr. Ethar. The answer is pulmonary stenosis. Now I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Okay. So first and foremost, let's talk about this. You have the pulmonary trunk arising from the right ventricle. You have the aortic trunk arising from the left ventricle. Okay. This is the interatrial septum, that's okay. Then you have the interventricular septum where there is a large VSD, okay? 
then what else? Then you have a pulmonary stenosis. Okay. Uh, then you have a pulmonary stenosis. And then you have another one that is overriding aorta. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to tell you what happens or what do I mean by overriding aorta. First and foremost, let's talk about two, the, these two things, ventricular septal defect and pulmonary stenosis. If there's a patient with ventricular septal defect and pulmonary stenosis, blood is coming into the right atrium. From the right atrium, it goes to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, is it easy for the blood to go this way or this way? One or two? Fast answers, please. One. Why? Because over here you have a pulmonary stenosis. So the blood is moving through this way, right? And the thing is, even though the blood is moving through this way, will some amount of blood try to move out through the pulmonary uh, trunk? Yes or no? Through the pulmonary blood vessel? The answer is yes. The heart will try to push the blood to the pulmonary blood vessel. So if the heart tries to push the blood through the pulmonary blood vessels, and we know over here there's an obstruction, should there be hypertrophy of the right ventricles? Yes or no? Because they're working so hard to push the blood in the right direction. The answer is yes. So the ventricles, the right ventricle, they undergo hypertrophy. Okay, the right ventricle, they undergo hypertrophy. Why? Because they want to push the blood in the right direction, but they're failing to do so. So they have to work more. That's how we come up with the third problem. The third problem is that um, the right ventricle is hypertrophy. The fourth problem is overriding of the aorta. What does this mean? Overriding of the aorta, this basically means that all the blood over here, instead of going through the pulmonary blood vessel, all the blood is going through the aorta. So the aorta is basically overridden, meaning that the aorta is overstressed. Are we clear? Yes or no? That all the blood are, is basically going through the aorta. So the aorta is basically overridden. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? All the blood is going through the aorta. Now, a uh, quick question. Did, did we understand the pathology? Did we understand the pathology? Okay. So due to anterior superior displacement of the infundibular septum, we have a ventricular septal defect and we have pulmonary stenosis. Blood tries to go through this pathway, number two pathway, but it cannot. Why? Because there is an obstruction, so blood moves this way. As a result, the ventricle, they try to push the blood more and since they're working more, they will undergo hypertrophy and all the blood will keep on moving through the aorta resulting in overriding of the aorta, as simple as that. Now, the question is, why do some patients of Tetralogy of Fellows squat down to relieve the symptoms? Does anyone have any idea? Can anyone explain why patients of, the, of Tetralogy of Fellows, they squat down to relieve their symptoms? Anyone? Can anyone explain why? Okay, Dr. Ethar? you seem to have a very solid idea why this happens. Can you explain to us why this happens? So as to push blood from the left to right, okay? So let me explain what Dr. Ethar is trying to say. When patients have excessive amount of blood flowing through the aorta, quick question, are they going to be uh, severely deoxygenated? Yes or no? And hypoxy? The answer is yes, okay. So, so you know like how our whole, the human body is made for survival and adaptations, yes or no? That we can adapt to different sorts of conditions, right? Like other mammals, like other mammals. We are, we are also a species of mammals where we would like to adapt to a different sort of situation. So a young child, when he or she realizes that uh, they are getting hypoxic, they squat down, and when they squat down, they realize that they start to feel better. They start to feel better. Okay, so what happens when they squat down? What happens to the pressure in the ascending aorta? Does it increase or does it decrease? Fast answers, please. When, when they squat down, what happens, to the, what happens to the pressure? They increase, meaning that when you squat, there's increase of afterload, yes? the afterload, they increase. When afterload increases now, 
now the pressure over here is very high. Now the pressure over here is very high. So the blood, instead of going this way through the tetralogy of fellow, can the blood now shunt back and go back to the VSD and push into the, this way, yes or no? The answer is yes. So when the patient squat and afterload increases and the blood goes back and moves in the original direction, now the deoxygenated blood, is it reaching the lungs properly? The answer is yes. So it's reaching the lungs properly. Now, will the deoxygenated blood get oxygenated? Fast answers, please. The answer is yes. Okay. So will the patients have relief of their sign symptoms? Yes. Okay. Are we crystal clear about this concept? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. Are we clear about this concept or not? It's very important to me that you guys understand the concepts. Okay. It's very important that you understand the concept. You do not have to remember. You do not have to memorize. You have to understand the concept. If you don't, if you do not understand the concept of step one, then your entire USMLE will get messed up. Okay, let me just put it out there very quickly. You have to make sure that you do your best to understand the concept because if you do not understand the concept of step one, you will not understand the concept of step two CK. And if you do not do well in these two exams, then it will be really difficult for you to land good residency program. All in all, everything is connected. Okay, it's like a domino effect. So please make sure that you understand the concept. Can anyone explain the tetralogy of fellow to me because of how important this is? Does anyone, is anyone interested in, in, in active participation? Can anyone explain wha, what tetralogy of fellow is? Why do we squat and it gets better? Anyone? No one, no problem. Okay, let's, let's move forward. In Tetralogy of Fellow, if I have to talk about it of Tetralogy of Fellow one more time, out of the four problems, if the pulmonary stenosis is severe, do we have severe Tetralogy of Fellow? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Okay. Um, okay, there's another concept I want to talk about. If there is a patient, okay, if there is a patient, okay, I'm not going to talk about this now, just, just wait one second. If there is a patient with VSD, right, if there's a patient with VSD, try to understand this concept. If there's a patient with a ventricular septal defect, will he or she have a murmur? First question, yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. Now, if the ventricular septal defect is large, if the ventricular septal defect is large, the blood moving from the right to left, can it move easily? The answer is yes. Okay. If it moves easily from right to left, the turbulence of blood, will it be high or will it be low? it will be low. So what would happen to the intensity of murmur? High or low? Low. So hearing a low murmur, hearing a low murmur in case of ventricular septal defect, is that good or is that bad? This is bad. Okay. Very good. As a matter of fact, both of them are bad, having a small one or a big one. But obviously, if you have a bigger BSD, then it's the outcome is usually going to be worse. Now, if the ventricular septal defect is small, if the defect is small, now when the blood goes through this small space, will there be more turbulence? Yes. OK the murmur intensity will be much larger, much loud murmur. This is somewhat okay. I do not want to say good because having a BSD is never good, okay? But we can expect that the murmur is small, okay? Are we clear, yes or no? Next one is total anomalous, total anomalous, pulmonary venous return. What is total anomalous pulmonary venous return? 
the pulmonary vein, do they drain into the right heart or into the left heart? Pass up, please. The pulmonary veins, do they drain into the right heart or into the left heart? Thank you so much. Why will the pulmonary vein drain into the right heart? Why are you guys saying right? Are we, are we aware that the right heart receives blood from inferior vena cava and superior vena cava? Okay. So can I ask you the question one more time? Pulmonary blood, uh, pulmonary vein, where do they drain their blood? Into the right heart or into the left heart? Okay. Thank you so much. Please avoid confusions, okay? So in your exam, if you get confused and scared and you uh, make, these basic mistakes, then things will go very, very wrong from the beginning. You have to, you have to stay very calm. You have, to, you have to stay very calm. You need to make sure you have a lot of patience because U.S. Assembly step one, is it a sprint or is this a marathon? Which one? The answer is this is a marathon, right? So if you know, like how sprinting, uh, you know, like people who do sprint races, right? They go very fast at the beginning. Marathon runners, they go nice and calm they, because they want to make sure that they finish the entire course, right? So you need to make sure that you are nice and calm. So when you get asked a question, think about it for one second and then make sure you answer. Uh, not in the lecture, in the actual exam. Over in the lecture, you can make as many mistakes as you want. The more the mistakes you make, the better because the more you learn. So having said that, the pulmonary veins obviously will drain into the left heart. Now, what if I tell you that there's a disease where the pulmonary vein, instead of draining into the left heart, is draining into the right heart? Is that a problem? Yes or no? Why? That's a problem because all the oxygenated blood is going back to the right heart. So will there be enough oxygenated blood uh, to reach the systemic circulation? The answer is no. So patients, will they get cyanotic or not? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, How, uh, if we have to uh, compare the yield of total anomalous pulmonary venous genosis, it's actually very low. It, it, it has a lower yield. It has a lower yield. And um, over here, the thing is, uh, in total anomalous pulmonary venous return, we will hear a sound that is, very simil that is very similar to the sound of PDA. And you know like how we hear the PDA sounds in the second intercostal space, yes or no? Do we hear the PDA sounds in the second in intercostal space or not? We hear the PDA sounds in the second intercostal space, right? The total anomalous pulmonary venous return sound will also be heard in the same region it, they will also be heard in the same region. So you have to differentiate the murmur of PDA with PATVR. Okay, are we clear? How do we differentiate the sound? The only way we can differentiate the sound is if we hear the sound. Okay. If we hear the sound. So if you guys can, I'm gonna paste this over here very quickly. Please click the link, hear the sound of this and hear the sound of this. Let me know what you guys think. Okay, so one of them is the sound of uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Another one is the sound of PDA. After you guys are done listening to the sound, please write down in the chat box so that I can move forward.
please write down in the chat box that if you're done listening to the sound. Are you guys listening to the sound or taking a break? Process, please. Can you guys hear my voice? You guys listening to the sound or not? Listening, thank you so much. Okay, I apologize for bothering you guys. Please listen to the sound carefully and let me know. If you're done, please write down in the chat box. Okay, Dr. Ellen, you're done. Thank you so much. Who else? Good. Does it sound the same? Or is there a slight difference? Can anyone tell me what they heard? Dr. Ellen, can you tell us what you heard? Can anyone tell us if they can differentiate the sounds or not? Does it sound somewhat similar at all? Yes or no? Very good, Dr. V, upper sternal is loud, okay. Can we can we move forward? Yes or no? Okay, Dr. S, I have a question. Can you re-explain about TOF when afterload increases, but will be more in the left ventricle? Uh, okay, when in a patient of tautology of the low, if afterload increases in squats, uh, the ascending aorta will have more pressure. Yes or no? Fast answers, please, everyone. The ascending aorta, will it have more pressure? Yes. So the blood, instead of going through the ascending aorta, will now shift back to the right ventricle, yes or no? The answer is yes. 
And then from the right ventricle, now can it go to the pulmonary circulation? And when it goes to the pulmonary circulation, the deoxygenation will get oxygenated by the lungs. So will there be relief of signs symptoms? The answer is yes, okay. So that's that. Let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to Epstein's anomaly. We talked about Epstein's anomaly, so I'm not gonna talk about this anymore. This atrialization of the left ventricle due to downward displacement of the tricuspid valves. Why do we get this? Due to lithium exposure, okay? Let's move forward to left to right shunt. Now, we are done with the cyanotic heart disease from the right to left. Now let's talk about left to right. When we talk about left to right, we have three problems, BSD, ASD, and PDA. Always remember this, ASD, BSD, and PDA. Now, left to right, what does this mean? This means that the blood is moving from the left side to the right side. Yes or no? If the blood moves from the left to the right, will there be less blood available in the systemic circulation? The answer is yes, okay? So the oxygenated blood will go to the right side and it will go to the lungs. As a result, the patients will, can they get hypoxic? Yes or no? The answer is yes, okay? But the good thing is, the good news is, a cyanotic heart disease is very common than cyanotic heart disease because a cyanotic heart disease, if the defects are small, we, the patients usually remain asymptomatic because as the patient ages and grows up, there is fixation of the septal defect by fibrosis. And these patients, we do not have any problem, okay? So that's it. But if the patient is symptomatic, then do we have to make sure that the patient undergoes some sort of an intervention, yes or no? The, end, the answer is yes. So let's talk about the first one, VSD. VSD is ventricular, uh, VSD is ventricular septal defect. What happens in VSD? In VSD, what happens is, first and foremost, we have a ventricular septal defect. Blood moves from the right side to the left side, initially for a short period of time. Then all this blood in the left side of the heart will accumulate, and now the shunt will shift from the left to right. Are we clear? Now the shunt will shift from, the, from left side to right side. And now we have the problem. So the thing is, if there is so much blood accumulating on the left side of the heart, my question is, will the left heart undergo hypertrophy? Yes or no? The answer is yes. The patients of VSD, are they at risk of developing heart failure? The answer is yes. Okay. What type of murmur do we hear in VSD? Hollow systolic murmur, hollow systolic murmur. And my apologies for, for the sound, there's some sort of a road work that's happening. Uh, okay, okay, so that's it. Now the question is, uh, if the VSD sound is uh, very large, if it's, if it's a very large sound, is the VSD small or is the VSD large? It's a small VSD, very good. Okay, so that's that. So that's all you basically need to know. This may lead to left ventricular failure. What type of questions are you going to receive from VSD? The questions you're going to receive is, they will give you a clinical scenario where, there, where, where they'll talk about a patient who comes to you with signs symptoms of fatigue, lethargy, cyanosis. Um, then all of a sudden you hear a hollow systolic murmur at the where left third intercostal space along the sternal border, basically in the tricuspid area. And they ask you, what is the most likely diagnosis? Most patient, most students, they are confused with TOF and VSD. They, they do not know which one is the answer. The, an the easiest thing is if patients have tetralogy of fellow, right? With all the blood going through the pulmonary circulation, will it result in splitting of the second heart sound? Yes or no? Because the pulmonary valve will close later than the, than the, systemic valve. So if the patient squats, then in a patient of TOF, tetralogy of fellow, when the patient squats down, there will be splitting of the second heart sound. The heart sound of the second heart sound will be split. Okay, as simple as that. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. And then again, which one is more severe, tetralogy of fellow or VSZ, the sign symptoms? The sign symptoms of tetralogy of fellow is more severe. 
Okay, let's move forward to the second one, atrial septal defect. Uh, another question you will receive from ventricular septal defect and atrial septal defect is most patients of ASD and VSD, they have an underlying problem. This problem is Down syndrome, especially ASD, especially patients of large atrial septal defects. They are pro, they have, uh, they have, or they already should have Down syndrome. It's associated with Down syndrome. So that's a, it's very high yield. This is another question they ask you in your exam. So atrial septal defect is basically a defect in the intraatrial septum. What sort of a splitting shall we hear in an ASD? Do you remember this? We hear a fixed splitting. Yes or no? We hear a fixed splitting. Where do we hear a paradoxical splitting of the S2? Fast answers, please. Where do we hear paradoxical splitting of S2? Aortic stenosis. Where do we hear a normal splitting of S2 or physiological splitting of S2? During inspiration, very good. Where do we hear uh, a wide splitting of S2? Wide splitting, pulmonary stenosis. Where do we hear fixed splitting of S2? ASD, okay, that's that. We all know why ASD develops. ASD develops because ostium secundum defects are most common. Do you remember how we had the heart developing, this is the dorsal endocardial cushion, the, sep uh, <clears throat> the septum primum forms, comes down towards the dorsal endocardial cushion. There's the foramen primum, it comes down, and then there's foramen secundum and ostium secundum. And do you remember how I told you that ostium secundum, if it doesn't fuse properly, then we will have an opening. This opening can result in atrial septal defect, as simple as that, okay? So the symptoms of atrial septal defect can be very mild, to heart failure. Why will the patients get heart failure? Once again, all the blood from the left side, are they going to the right side? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So the left ventricle, does it have to work more to push the blood out into the systemic circulation? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So when it does that, will it undergo hypertrophy? Fast answer, please. The answer is yes. As a result, they can develop heart failure. But usually in atrial septal defects, we do not get heart failure. It's not that severe, okay? Uh, what is the difference between atrial septal defect and patent foramen ovale? The difference is not many. The pathology is more or less the same. There is a pathway in the interatrial septum. But the thing is, uh, the difference is basically in the morphology. What is the morphology? In atrial septal defect, you have persistence of foramen secundum, right? In uh, patent foramen ovale, there is absence of miss, I mean, there's absence of tissue, meaning that the foramen ovale does not close properly due to lack of fibrosis. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. Everyone, are we clear about this? Okay, let's move forward to the second one, that is patent ductus arteriosus. Patent ductus arteriosus is basically when the ductus arteriosus is patent, meaning that the blood is moving from the pulmonary circulation to the systemic circulation directly. Okay, so what happens is that in fetal period, the shunt is right to left. And then what happens is as the, as the fetus grows older, for example, what happens when the baby cries, then what happens? Uh, the lungs expand. When the lungs expand, the blood is going to the lungs right now instead of going through the ductus arteriosus. When the blood goes to the lungs, okay, let me show you what happens over here. One second. Okay, what's happening? This is the baby's heart in the mother's uterine cavity. Okay, you, over here, you have the pulmonary trunk. You have the ascending trunk. This is the ductus arteriosus, okay? This is the Dr. Sartiyotis. Now, after the baby is born, does the baby cry? Fast answers, please. Does the baby cry? The answer is yes. Okay, when the baby cries, the blood coming like this, the blood coming like this, now will the blood go to the lungs? Yes or no, when the, when the baby cries? The answer is yes. And then the oxygenated blood will come back to the left atrium,
and then it'll move down like this. And then the blood will move back like this. Again, they'll go to the lungs and they'll come like this. So before birth, the shunt was like this. The shunt was in this direction. But after birth, what happened? The shunt reversed. Yes or no? Okay. Since after birth, the shunt reversed. Now all the blood is flowing like this only. Is, is the blood reaching the systemic circulation properly due to the ductus arteriosus? The answer is no. Will the baby have fatigue and hypoxia? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, so what do we do for patent ductus arteriosus? First and foremost, what are the clinical presentation? The patients will come to you with signs, symptoms of fatigue, lethargy, <laughs> unable to feed, and then they'll have a murmur. What sort of a murmur? The murmur will be a continuous machine-like murmur because of all the turbulence that's happening over here. The turbulence is happening over here, right? It'll be continuously be flowing in through the ductus arteriosus and we'll hear the murmur and then we'll do an echocardiogram where we see that there is persistence of the ductus arteriosus, and then we'll go for two types of management. Number one is a medical management. Number two is a surgical management. Medical management is we, we will try to close the ductus arteriosus. How? By prostaglandin or NSAID? Dr. Francis, please. Prostaglandin or NSAID? Which one? Very good right? NSAID, because we know prostaglandin keeps the duct open. So endomethacin, especially, which is a very strong NSAID, they will close and prevent the release of prostaglandin by how? By preventing the breakdown of the arachidonic acid. Yes or no? We know that the arachidonic acid is broken down by phospholipase A2, right? And then the arachidonic acid enters the lipoxygenase pathway and the leukotrienes. Leuko and the there is leukotrienes, lipoxins, and prostaglandin. Yes or no? NSAID will block the breakdown of arachidonic acid. And as a result, prostaglandin will be less. If prostaglandin is less, then the ducts will close faster. And eventually, if the medical management does not work, we have to go for surgical fixation of the patent ductus arteriosus. Are we clear? Yes or no? Everyone, okay, let's come to the text. Over here, in neonatal period, decreased pulmonary vascular resistance, shun becomes left to right, progressive right ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular hypertrophy and heart feeding. This is exactly what I said a little while back. It's associated with a machine-like continuous murmur. The patency is maintained by prostaglandin E and uncorrected PDA can result in late cyanosis, okay? Please underline these things. All right, okay, let's move forward to the next one. Okay, next one is, if there is a patient who has a ventricular septal defect, for example, let's say that this patient, he or she has a, ventricular septal defect. Initially, blood will go from the right side to the left side. Yes. And then all the blood will accumulate over here. And then the shunt will reverse from the left side to the right side. Yes or no? The answer is yes. All the blood that's accumulating in the left side, will it increase the left ventricular pressure? Yes or no? Yes, okay. It, they will increase the left ventricular pressure. That's number one. Number two, all the blood, this is number one. Number two is all the blood that's going to the right side of the heart. Will it result in more blood going to the lungs? Yes or no? The answer is yes. As a result, we have increase of pulmonary blood flow. If there's increase of pulmonary blood flow, will we get pulmonary hypertension, yes or no? The answer is yes. So this condition of pulmonary hypertension in a patient due to long-term 
presence of VSD will result in a disease called Eisenmenger syndrome. What's happening? I'm going to repeat myself one more time. Increase of left ventricular pressure will prevent the blood coming to the left side and increase of blood will flow to the lungs. As a result, due to both these conditions, pulmonary blood flow and increased left ventricular pressure, the blood will stay in the lungs for a longer period of time, resulting in pulmonary hypertension. This pulmonary hypertension developing can result in a disease called Eisenmenger syndrome, which is pulmonary hypertension due to VSD. Okay, so that's it. Um, another thing is all of this blood that will stay in the lungs for a long period of time, can it also predispose the patient to develop respiratory tract infections, yes or no? The answer is yes. So not only will the patients have uh, risk, um, pulmonary hypertension, they can also get respiratory tract infections. Next one, all of these blood that is flowing back to the uh, right heart, along with the fact that the left ventricle will undergo hypertrophy, the right ventricle, do they also have to work more? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So can the right ventricle also undergo hypertrophy? The answer is yes. Okay. So that's that. That is Eisenmenger syndrome. This is the pathology of Eisenmenger syndrome. Are we clear? Okay, uh, we're still not done. There's one more disease and this is very high yield. Can anyone tell me the name of this disease that is associated, especially with a female? Okay, let me tell you a clinical scenario. Okay, a female comes to you with absence of menstruation. The female has uh, early tanner stage breast development decreased secondary sexual characteristic, webbing of the neck, broad shaped chest, streak gonads. Okay, yes, very good. This is, this is a female who is supposed to have two X chromosomes has only one X chromosome, X and a zero. This is a female of 45 XO, or we call this syndrome as Turner's syndrome, okay? In Turner's syndrome, we have a very major congenital heart problem. Can anyone name that major congenital heart problem? Anyone? What is that major heart problem? Dr. Ellen, yes. Dr. Jorge, VK, Dr. VK, thank you so much, yes. The disease I'm talking about is co-arctation, Dr. Hagar, thank you so much, co-arctation of aorta, okay? What is co-arctation of aorta and what's happening? One second. Okay, good, very good, co-arctation of aorta. Okay, what's, what's happening in the co-arctation of aorta? This is the face, this is the heart, this is the brain. Uh, these are the ribs. Okay. This is and Why am I drawing this? I'm gonna explain myself. Just give me one second. Okay. So over here, um, in coarctation of aorta, what's happening? The blood is moving from the left ventricle all the way up to where? Fast answers, please. Blood is moving to the, which blood vessel? 
from the left ventricle, where does the blood go? Okay, they go to the aorta, right? If I tell you that over here, what are these blood vessels? Pass out, please. These are what? The brachiocephalic trunk, left common, left subclavian. If there is an obstruction, okay? If there is an obstruction over here, can the blood move down properly? Yes or no? No. As a result, will more blood flow up? The answer is yes. So, will more blood reach the brain? Okay. So these patients, can they get hemorrhagic stroke or aneurysms? Yes. Next one. All the blood moving through the subclavians and the brachiocephalic. Are they going to increase the blood flow through the ribs? Yes, okay. So the ribs, in a, in a young stage, we know that the bones, they are not ossified properly, right? So can they get eaten up? Like there's not eaten up. The blood vessels, can they have a notched appearance of the, of the ribs? Yes or no? Okay, this, these types of notches. Another one, blood is moving more through the left subclavian. So pressure in the hand, will it be higher than the pressure in the legs? Yes. Can we get radio femoral delay? Yes or no? Okay. So that's that. Did you guys understand the pathology of coarctation of aorta? Okay. That's that. So what is coarctation of aorta? This is aortic narrowing near the insertion of ductus arteriosus. This is called juxta ductal, meaning around the ductus. As you can see over here, the, this is the coarctation. Okay, it's associated with other problems, I'm gonna tell you, but it's mainly associated with Turner syndrome. Patients have hypertension in upper extremities and delayed pulse in lower extremities, okay? Do you guys hear the sound outside my window by any chance? Yes or no? Okay, I apologize for this. Yes, give me one second. I Apologize, there's a road work that's happening in, 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 in front of our building and uh, we apologize for this sound, but can you guys hear my voice properly? Yes or no? Yes. Can you guys hear my voice properly? Yes, okay, good. The reason why I started the lecture half an hour later is because at 9.30, they started the work Yes, at 9.30, they started working, and at 9.30, the sound was much worse, okay? So, you know, like, I, uh, for example, like, I, I actually am from Bangladesh, and from and in Bangladesh, you would, you would I mean, like, I, I would expect, even in Bangladesh, I wouldn't really expect um, the road to undergo this sort of work, the amount of work that gets done over here in New York, especially. So, you know, like sometimes I wonder staying back in Bangladesh was actually a much better choice than staying over here. If you guys ever get the choice of coming to New York, don't, okay, do not. Do not come to New York. It's a, do, it's a, it's a, it's a facade. 
Okay, it's a it's a joke. It's false. Okay, exactly. Bangladesh roads are much much better, and also people are much better. People are much nicer over here. New York is something else. Okay. So I apologize for the problem and I apologize for today. Uh, I wanted to start the lecture at 9.30, but at 9.30, the sound was much worse than it is now. So uh, please bear with me. Yeah. Did you guys understand cooperation of aorta? Yes or no? Okay. So complications, they include heart failure, cerebral hemorrhage, aortic rupture, and endocarditis. Okay, these are the problems of cooperation of aorta. Are we clear about this? Okay. There you go. Next one. Okay, next one is this one. Are we ready? Yes or no? Congenital heart disease, congenital association. Congenital RDX association. Okay. Now, first and foremost, let me draw the heart. So what am I doing over here? Over here, I'm trying to come up with mnemonics and diagrams that will allow you guys to remember different sorts of associations associated with different sorts of heart problems. Okay, are we ready? Okay. Okay, so let's begin. Um, the first one is, uh, can you guys just give me one second, please? My apologies, just give me one quick second. Okay, can you guys hear my voice now? Yes or no? Is it much better now? You guys hear the hissing sound in the back? Okay, thank God. Okay, so let's begin. Okay. So now let's talk about this. So what I wanna do is uh, I wanna give you guys some hints, some diagrams that will allow you to sort of remember what sort of a problem is associated with what congenital heart disease, okay? For example, this is a heart of, um, this is the heart of a fetus, okay? This is the heart of a fetus. The first mnemonic is the mother is drinking a beverage that is destroying the septa over here. As a result, the patients develop ASD. The mother is drinking another beverage. For example, think of it, for example, that the mother is having alcohol, right? Alcohol is corrosive. They'll come and then they will destroy the septa in between the two atrias. Then they'll come and then they'll destroy the septa in between the two ventricles. Okay. Now, in reality, does alcohol really come to the heart and destroy the interatrial septa and the interventricular septa? Yes or no? In reality, the answer is no. This is just a mnemonic so that you remember so that you remember. This is not a pathology. Please keep in mind alcohol will not come to the heart and they'll come and destroy his, uh, the interatrial septum and destroy the interventricular septum. This is just a mnemonic so that you remember so that you remember what sort of association is associated with what sort of heart disease. Think of a mother drinking alcohol, think of the alcohol directly coming to the heart and corrosing the interatrial septa and the interventricular septa resulting in ASD and BSD, okay? 
let's say that the mother drinks exactly four alcohol every day. With the help of four alcohol every day, can we remember tetralogy of Fallot? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So that's that. And the mother drinks alcohol persistently, persistent drinking of alcohol. With persistent drinking of alcohol, can we remember PDA, persistent ductus arteriosus? The answer is yes. So alcohol is associated with what sort of heart diseases? If the mother drinks alcohol, the babies will get? Fast answers, ASD, VSD, tetralogy of Fallot, and PDA. Is it easy to remember now, yes or no? Is it easy to remember now? Okay, how do we remember this? With the help of a image or an imagining mnemonic. We are imagining a mother who is drinking four alcoholic beverages persistently every day. This four alcoholic beverages, they're going to the heart of the baby. They're destroying the atria and they're destroying the ventricles. With this small story, this is a story. This is not a pathology. This is a story. This is not real, okay? With this story, we can remember that the patients will develop ASD, VSD, persistent for PDA and for alcohol for tetralogy of fallot. Okay, are we clear? Yes or no? Good. Next one. Next one is, let's assume, okay? Let's assume that uh, there is a patient whose name is, whose name is Ruby, okay? Just let's assume that there's a patient whose name is Ruby. Now, the thing is, this patient has two problems, okay? This patient, number one, uh, not problems. This, this patient basically likes to do two things. They, she, she likes to play with a machine gun. She likes to play with a machine gun. Another one is she, when she plays with the machine gun, um, when she, I mean, when she was playing with the machine gun, she got, uh, she got hurt. Where? She got hurt in her chest, especially the lungs. Is this a very simple story to remember? Yes or no? There is a young child called Ruby who likes playing with machine gun. While playing with the gun, she got hurt in her chest, especially in the lungs. Can we use this mnemonic to remember that the name Ruby is for congenital rubella, machine gun for machine gun murmur, that is PDA, and trauma to the chest is pulmonary artery stenosis. Yes or no? Okay. Okay, so bear with me over here. After this discussion, you'll remember all the information very easily. Can you guys tell me, I discussed this. I don't wanna make any mnemonic for this one. Give me one second. Next one is um, a patient of Down syndrome. Okay, a patient of Down syndrome will get what problems? Five answers, please. A patient of Down syndrome will get what? What problems? ASD. BSD, right? ASDs and BSDs. So we do not need any mnemonic for this one, okay? We do not need any mnemonic for this one. Next one is lithium exposure. Will cause what problem? Epstein, very well, okay? Turner syndrome. 
will cause what problem? We just read the problem, coarctation. And also bicuspid valve, bicuspid valve. If you can remember this without the help of the mnemonic, that'll be, that'll be okay. Okay, next one is, next one is a young child Okay. Next one is a young child, right? You know, like how young children, they like to wear graphic t-shirts. This young child, he's wearing a graphic t-shirt of, uh, one second. Can anyone tell me what this sign, what this sign like indicates? I'm not sure if I'm drawing this correctly. Superman, he has a very good, that's what I'm trying to draw. I'm not really sure if I'm succeeding drawing that. Yes. How do you draw Superman sign? Okay. A young child is wearing this sort of a sign, right? This sort of a sign. Something like this. Okay. The child is wearing this sign. The name of this child is William, and he is wearing a Superman t-shirt. This will allow you to remember that there's a disease called Williams syndrome, okay? Where patients, it's a congenital disease where patients have elfin like faces, mental retardation, and a lot of different things we'll talk about in the future. They have a disease called supra valvular aortic stenosis. So you can use this mnemonic of a young child with the name of William wearing a Superman t-shirt for supravalvular aortic stenosis. Are we clear, yes or no? Yes, okay. Next one. Next one is there's a disease called 22Q11 syndrome. What is the name of the what is the name of this disease? Does anyone know? What is the name of 22Q11 syndrome? Very good. George. This is this is a child. You know, like how. Okay, one second. Okay, can anyone tell me what this is? This is a tree. Yes, very good. In this tree, you have a child who is hanging on the tree, okay? Hanging on the tree trunk, uh, not hanging as in like, uh, like <laughs> not suicide wise, hanging in the sense of that he's just playing with, um, for example, he is, for example, he is, um, do you guys really think that I, I would draw a child who was committing suicide on a, a trunk of a tree. Okay, no. Okay, so I wouldn't do that. So this is a child who's hanging. Yes, like a monkey. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yes, like a monkey. So a child like this who is hanging on the trunk. The name of this child is George. Okay, George hanging on a tree trunk is for truncus arteriosus associated with de George syndrome. De George syndrome. Okay, are we clear? Yes or no? 
another thing is this tree has how many trunks? One, two, three, four. So four trunks for another disease. Can anyone name the disease with four? Tetralogy of the low. Okay. Okay, let's see how much you guys have learned. Okay, let's, let's see how much you guys have learned. First and foremost, mother drinking alcohol, alcohol exposure. What will it cause? Fast chances, please. Mother drinking for alcohol persistently. ASD, VSD, PDA, very good. And, and another one was she was drinking four alcohol, four glass of alcohol, tetralogy of fellow. Okay, next one. Uh, congenital rubella. Okay, do you guys remember the child whose name was Ruby? What was she doing? She was playing with a very good. So persistent doctor's arteriosis and, and what else? She got hurt in the chest, pulmonary artery stenosis. Very good. Thank you so much. Next one is Down syndrome. Down syndrome for ASD, VSD. What else? Uh, lithium. Four. Epstein anomaly. Very good. Turner syndrome. Four. Coarctation of aorta. William syndrome. What was William doing? <clears throat> He was wearing a t-shirt which said what? The t-shirt the was that of a Superman. So this is supravalvular aortic, supravalvular aortic stenosis. Then George hanging on the tree trunk. In the George syndrome, what do we get? Funcus arteriosus and how many tree trunks were there? Four, so pathology of below. Okay, so we're done with majority of them. We still, we have a little bit more left. <clears throat> that is, if the mother has diabetes, what will the child have? If the mother has diabetes, the child will have transposition of great vessels. Okay, so we use mnemonics for all of this ones. So this one we can remember without the help of a mnemonic. Okay, transposition of great vessels. We also get another one. We also get what happens is, let me tell you, in, in mothers who has diabetes, right? The infant, um, are they exposed to high amount of glucose? Yes or no? The hyperglycemia, the glucose can cross and cross the placenta. Do you know what the glucose does? The glucose, they, they accumulate in the left ventricle. And glucose is very sticky and starchy, yes or no? The glucose is very sticky and the glucose is very starchy. So they accumulate in the left ventricle and they cause this sort of an obstructive cardiomyopathy, an obstructive cardiomyopathy. But the good news is the, the glucose that accumulates in the left ventricle and causing this obstructive cardiomyopathy, this is reversible. This is reversible. So can we expect children of diabetic mothers to have uh, early onset of cardiomyopathy? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Why? All the glucose in the baby's blood vessels, they are draining into the left heart. That is, that is accumulating over here and causing an obstructive cardiomyopathy, number one. Number two, they can cause transposition of great vessel. And sometimes we can also get ventricular septal defect. Okay, are we clear, yes or no? Okay, last one. We have a disease, it's a connective tissue disease of a gene called FBN1, a fibrillin gene, <clears throat> where our patients, they can appear very tall and their joints could be uh, hyperlax and elastic. This disease is called Marfins. 
Marfan syndrome. If it's a disease where connective tissue is elastic, do you remember yesterday I talked about a uh, valvular disease where we will get an elasticity? For example, if in a patient of Marfan syndrome, if the valve, this valve over here is elastic, very highly elastic and lax, every time the valve closes, when the blood pushes up, can we have ballooning of the valve like this? The answer is yes. This is called mitral valve prolapse. Another one is that the blood vessels of the patient of Martin syndrome, are they also lax? lax? Yes or no? Are they also lax, the blood vessels? So whenever where there's a high blood flow, can they push on the blood vessel and the blood vessels can have this ballooning appearance? Yes. The answer is yes. So patients can get aortic aneurysm. And can, can, I, can the blood vessels get weak over time with aneurysm? The answer is yes. At one point, can there be formation of an external pathway in between the layers of the blood vessels where blood can pass through? The answer is yes. So at one point, patients are also at risk of getting a dissection, aortic dissection, dissection, okay. Very good. So with that being said, we have learned about all the problems. Fast questions, uh, the quick questions, quick answers, one more time, one more time. Alcohol exposure is, is associated with ASD, VSD, PDA, pathology of the low. Congenital rubella syndrome is associated with a young child called Ruby was playing with a machine gun. She got hurt in her chest, very good. Uh, Down syndrome is associated with ASD, VSD. In infant of a diabetic mother is associated with Transposition of weight vessels, BSD, very good. Uh, lithium is associated with, very good. Turner syndrome is associated with, a young child called William, who was wearing a Superman t-shirt for William syndrome associated with, very good. A young child called George who was hanging on a tree trunk and there were four tree trunks for the George syndrome associated with. Okay. And Marfan syndrome is associated with. Well, so congratulations. You guys are done with this one. This is exceptionally high yield. So in the future, do we need to memorize or can we just um, learn smart? Please try to learn smart and have a little bit of fun when you're, when you're, when you're learning, right? So that you'll remember the information more easily. Okay, uh, let me give you another piece of, piece of advice before I move forward. Okay. Do you guys realize that it's easy for you to remember movies than it is for you to remember texts? Yes or no? Which one is more easier? Movies or texts? Text. Uh, uh, movies, right? Do you know why? Let me let me let me tell you why. The area in your brain which is responsible for storing memories, right? Especially the uh, especially the mammary bodies, amygdala, and your, um, basically your limbic system, right? It's very easy for the limbic system and the amygdala to remember, to remember pictures, to remember pictures. Because pictures, basically what they have is they have information. They have information in, Colors. 
right? And they have other things. They have animations, they have movements, which we can easily remember. Texts, usually when you read a book, the reason why you remember a text is only if you're associating the text with an imaginative picture. Isn't that what we do, yes or no? We imagine, we imagine this. Okay? I'm only talking about memorization or understanding, so that's it. So text, if you have to remember a text, we usually remember this by imagination. That imagination turns into picture. That picture gets stored in the amygdala and then we, we remember this. So in first state for step one, you do not have to memorize a lot of things. Mostly the things are the fact that you have to understand the concepts and you have to remember. I mean, you have to understand the concepts and apply the knowledge. But in some cases like these tables where you have no option but to memorize because there's nothing to understand, only the only you have to remember the information. Please try to make sure in the future that you associate pictures somehow with the information. Are we clear? That way you'll remember the information for a long period of time. Okay, have I, have I made myself clear? Okay, good. So with that being said, let's take a small break for 15 minutes and let's come back and uh, let's begin with the rest of the text. Okay, so it's 11.55 as of right now. Let's start the lecture at 12.10 p.m. Okay, so thank you so much.
Yeah. Okay, is everyone back from their breaks? Can you guys hear my voice? Yes, okay, so let's begin. Okay, so till now we are done with uh, congenital cyanotic and cyanotic heart disease, their pathology, their management, their presentation, uh, and everything else. Then we got done with congenital cardiac defect associations. And uh, now we're going to begin talking about hypertension. Is everyone ready to begin? Yes or no? Okay, good. So what is hypertension? Hypertension is when persistently the systolic blood pressure is more than 130, diastolic is more than 80, okay? If uh, someone has hypertension for the first time that they visit the doctor's office, are we going to declare them as a patient who has hypertension? No. What are we gonna do? First of all, a lot of patients, we need to, we need to exclude white coat hypertension. A lot of patients, when they come to the doctor's office, fresh and foremost, they get scared. And then there's a sympathetic response. That sympathetic response results in a transient increase in blood pressure, which is represented as the hypertension that happens under the influence of fear when they see the white coat of the physicians. So we repeat and we wait, we talk to the physician, we talk to the patient, let them calm down for a little bit. Then we measure it again after 10 to 15 minutes. If it's okay, then, then fine. If it's not okay after 10 to 15 minutes, then we ask them to monitor the, their blood pressure at home each uh, every day for at least seven days and then ask them to write down their blood pressure readings on a notebook or on a piece of paper and then bring it to us. If we see that the average blood pressure of this patient throughout the entire week is more than 130 by 80, then we can declare them as a patient of hypertension. Uh, for US, hypertension is very important because of the fact that hypertension is very closely related to diet. Okay, and how many of us are aware that the American diet is not a very optimum diet? Yes or no? For majority of American, for majority of Americans, basically being uh, basically um, of the busy schedule, the easy access to food, the cheap food that's available everywhere, <clears throat> and uh, with a high amount of preservatives and uh, especially what comes with preservatives is that that when something is preserved for a long period of time, they're preserved in salt, right? So the sodium content of these preservatives are extremely high. So if you have to have risk factors, number one, I need you to focus on this one first, high sodium diet, okay? The reason why I need you to focus on this is because when they ask you for interventions, the first thing that you're gonna do is diet, okay? Diet, what sort of a diet? DASH, okay? DASH diet. That's a diet less in carbohydrate, high in protein, vegetables, and low sodium, okay? So that's it. The second most common reason for having um, hypertension in the US is uh, excessive alcohol intake. So this is number one, this is number two. Alcohol is very highly associated and uh, it's also very widely available. And uh, people are uh, known to drink a little bit more um, than the other countries, especially uh, US, UK, Australia, and all of those other Western countries where alcohol is uh, an easy access. Alcohol is a major risk factor. Then it goes without saying tobacco and smoking. It's very high, uh, it's very high yield for risk factors because they promote endothelial injury, right? When we get endothelial injury, what do we get? We get the one, one of three Varkos triad. Varkos triads are three. I'm pretty sure you guys know this, right? Number one is endothelial injury, then stasis. Another one is hypercoagulability. Okay. Um, if we have the initiation of Varkos triad, the rest of the three, the rest, the rest two will follow very quickly. It's like, it's like a domino. So endothelial injury, it begins with smoking and with stasis and hypercoagulability, you start having atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis results in narrowing of the blood vessels. As a result, it's difficult for blood to push through the blood vessels. After load increases and 
patients have hypertension. Then we have age, obesity, diabetes, physical inactivity. These are that. Another one is, um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, another one is this one. That is, incidence is great. In. Now, this is something, this is a learning curve for us. I'm going to tell you how this is a learning curve. This text, first aid, has recently gotten a lot of uh, bashing for not using the proper words to describe each ethnic group of people. Okay, what is the learning curve for us? The learning curve for us is since a lot of international medical graduates, we are unaware of the racial issues that goes on in this country, right? We learn these things from the textbook and then we apply them in our daily life when we come to the state, completely oblivious to how our words are going to affect people or how they're affecting the, how they're affecting certain movements. This goes without saying that in the future, when, if you were to write something or get yourself involved in a research and you have to describe ethnicity, please refrain from using words that describe color. That's very simple. Instead of saying black, what you are supposed to say is African-American, okay? Instead of saying white, you're supposed to say Caucasian. Asian is fine, Asian is Asian. Okay. Are we clear, yes or no? Because I'm not really sure what they are indicating by the word black. I mean, is it black because of African-American black? Is it black because of the skin is black? You understand what I mean? You know, like a lot of people from my country, they have the same skin color as African American. So does that mean that they also have a bigger predisposition to hypertension? Yes or no? The answer is obviously no, right? So that's that. So this is, <clears throat> this is something which I really want to uh, bring it up in the classes. And uh, nowadays, in, eventually in the next textbook, we're all hoping that they'll take this into consideration and use better words to describe different groups of people. Are we clear, yes or no? So this goes without saying that prevalence-wise, according to prevalence, African-Americans have been shown to have a higher incidence of blood pressure. The reason being is because there's another Thing that will be mentioned in the future when we will read. The treatment of hypertension is different for African-Americans <clears throat> and Caucasians and Asians. <clears throat> There's also a sort of um, a treatment discrepancy, which also needs to sort of change. But even till now in USMLE, we have African-Americans who are going to be treated first with thiazide diuretics and then ACE inhibitors. And we don't know why. That we only assume this because the book says so. In Caucasians, we'll start with ACE inhibitors, beta blockers first, then thiazide diuretics, okay? So this is something which you have to, under, which you, which you have to remember for your exam purposes. But in all in all, I personally, I believe that they should have better explanations for the text which they have written. Okay, so that's that. So not only am, am I awareing you guys on, on, on using better uh, words and better languages to describe people, <clears throat> I'm also awareing you of the questions and the answers you'll face in your exam. So African-Americans, since they have a higher incidence of uh, hypertension, their first choice of the first line of drugs is thiazide. For Caucasians, the first line of drugs is beta blockers or ACE inhibitors. Are we clear? Yes or no? According to first aid. Okay. Okay. Let's move forward. 90% hypertension is primary hypertension. That is, uh, it develops sporadically due to increased cardiac output or increase of total peripheral resistance. And 2%, I mean, the remaining 10% are mostly due to renovascular hypertension. Anything, if I tell you that there's anything that is obstructing the renal artery, right? If there's anything that's obstructing the renal artery, will it activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? Yes or no? The answer is yes. If it activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone, will we have increased absorption of blood volume? I mean, in increased absorption of water? The answer is yes, right? 
salt and water will increase. So that's that. Okay, we also have another condition why there could be uh, increase of hypertension. For example, if a patient has pheochromocytoma, can they have hypertension? <clears throat> yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So that's that. Now, when someone has hypertension, especially when the hypertension is 180 over, 20, over 120, right? When the, when the hypertension is 180 over 120 or more, in this sort of a situation, <clears throat> we describe the patient in two contexts. One who has signs symptoms of organ damage, another one who does not have signs symptoms of organ damage. One, the one who has signs symptoms of organ damage, we call this hypertensive emergency. Ones who have 120 over 80 with no signs symptoms of organ damage, we call this hypertensive urgency, meaning they can develop organ damage in the future, so they need urgent intervention. Okay, in both these cases, the patient needs to be treated at the hospital, yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's it. What are the signs symptoms of organ damage that we can expect with a blood pressure 180 over 120? That is, we can expect myocardial ischemia, transient ischemic attacks, stroke, right? then renal failure, renal uh, infarctions, clinic infarction, different, different sorts of problems. So that's that. So that's hypertensive urgency and emergency. So you need to understand which one is which. Patients are obviously predisposed to coronary artery diseases, left ventricular failure, heart failure, atrial fibrillation. This is extremely high yield, aortic dissection. Let me tell you, if there's a patient who has persistently high hypertension, I mean, persistent hypertension, all of a sudden now presents to you with severe tearing back pain and the blood pressure is 180 over 100. What is your diagnosis? Your diagnosis is dissection, okay? Your diagnosis is dissection. If there's another patient who comes to you with sudden onset of severe abdominal pain on palpation, you find an abdominal pulsating mass with hypertension. What is your diagnosis? pulsating mass in the abdomen, abdominal aortic aneurysm, okay? Are we clear? So that's that. Let's move forward and talk about the signs and symptoms of hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia, signs and symptoms of hyperlipidemia. First and foremost, these pictures are very important. Why? Because they use these exact pictures in the exam, okay? These are very similar or these are exactly the same pictures they use in the exam. There are three things that we see in a patient who has persistently high lipid level. These are xanthomas, tendinous xanthomas, and corneal arcus. Xanthomas are basically plaques or nodules, which are composed of lipid-laden histiocytes in the skin. That's that. Uh, tendinous xanthoma are, are the same thing. Instead of depositing on the skin, they deposit on the tendons like this. Okay, and corneal arcus are basically rings in the cornea due to deposition of lipid, as you can see over here. Okay, do you guys need any further explanation for these things, yes or no? I highly doubt you do because this is very straightforward. Okay, next one is arteriosclerosis. Okay, let me break down the word, arteriosclerosis. Cis. What does this mean? Not atherosclerosis, not arteriolosclerosis. This is arteriosclerosis. This is a broad term, a very broad term, which consists of anything that will thicken the artery. Sclerosis is the word for thickening. Arterio for artery. Anything that thickens your blood vessel, especially the arteries, we call this arteriosclerosis, as simple as that. In arteriosclerosis, we have two types of things. Okay, let me talk about this in a blank page. Okay, so we're talking about arteriosclerosis. So arteriosclerosis, we have, this is a broad term, arteriosclerosis. Sclerosis. This is a broad term in which we have two 
problems. Number one is R K R O low low sclerosis. Another one is Monkberg calcific sclerosis or Monkberg's sclerosis. Not MS usually denotes multiple sclerosis. I'm gonna write Monkberg, M-O-N-K-E, Monkberg S or Monkberg sclerosis. We also call this uh, medial calcific sclerosis. So arterial low sclerosis are basically, these are hardening of the arteries, right? These are hardening of the arteries. Over here, the hardening of the arteries, the word we use arterial low. This low is used to denote small arteries. So basically, what are the reasons why we can get thickening of small arteries? There are two reasons. Number one is high align. Number two is hyperplastic. What is high align arterial low sclerosis? High align arterial low sclerosis is when the blood vessels over here, they have pores, right? Uh, the blood vessels, they have pores, okay? They have pores, they, or they develop pores, right? For example, they can develop pores in hypertension when there is a high blood pressure, okay? Do you guys remember from yesterday, we talked about net fluid pressure, yes or no? We talked about PC, then this one, and PI, and this one, yes or no? You guys remember this? If we have hypertension, which one will be high? A, B, C, or D? PC, PI, Pi C, or Pi I? Which one will be high in hypertension? Very good. Thank you so much. So if PC is high, will we have more fluid coming out? Yes or no? If more fluid comes out, by fluid, do we mean plasma? Do we mean plasma? Yes or no? no. Plasma, do they have protein? Plasma proteins? Yes or no? The plasma proteins, they will start to come out and they will start to accumulate in the lining of the blood vessels with hypertension. As a result, can we get thickening and hardening of the blood vessels, yes or no? The answer is yes. Just as how hypertension can do this, in diabetes, can high amount of glucose also come out because of the high glucose that stays in the blood? The glucose, get, like plasma protein, can they also get sticky and uh, stick onto the walls of the blood vessels? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So in higher line arteriosclerosis, due to hypertension and diabetes mellitus, we can get hardening like this. That's that. So that's all about higher line. Another one is hyperplastic. What is hyperplastic? What is hyperplastic? In hyperplastic arteriolo sclerosis, arteriolo sclerosis, we have this problem. What is the problem? In hyperplastic uh, arteriolo sclerosis, we have, this is the blood vessels. We have proliferation. Do you know like how blood vessels, they have smooth muscles, yes or no? In the tunica media, we have smooth muscles, right? In the tunica media. What if there is proliferation of the smooth muscle? Okay. Can they consume the blood vessel? Yes or no? If they proliferate? The answer is yes. When they consume the blood vessels, they look, they look something like this. When you take a biopsy of the blood vessel, and you see it under a microscope, right? What do you see? You see that the blood vessels look like this. If this is a vegetable, then what sort of a vegetable has this sort of skin? You keep on peeling and it comes out, peeling and comes up. 
ไม่ไม่ไม่อันนี้ so if you take a small piece of the blood vessel wall and you see it under a mic and under a under a microscope you see proliferation of blood vessels in an onion skin pattern okay are we clear yes or no Uh, another one is another one is Monkberg Monkberg sclerosis. What is Monkberg sclerosis? This is actually very low yield. Why is it low yield? Because Monkberg sclerosis is very uncommon. It's a very uncommon cause of arterial sclerosis. Monkberg sclerosis affects, for example, arterial low sclerosis affects what type of blood vessels? Large, medium, small, small. Monkberg sclerosis, they affect medium-sized blood vessels. How do they affect the medium-sized blood vessels? What happens is in the blood vessels, we have, an, uh, we have tunica intima, tunica media. And uh, what happens is that there is depositions of calcium there's deposition of calcium in the intima and the media. As a result, the blood vessels, they get calcific. If they get calcific, will they become thick and hard? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So if we do, if we do an x-ray, can we see these blood vessels? Yes. Are we clear, yes or no? no? Next one is under a microscope, when we take a piece of tissue, do we use stain? Yes or, yes or no? The answer is yes. We usually use hematoxylin and using stain. In hematoxylin and, and using stain, if you see a blood vessel, that looks like this. Over here, there is, um, over here, there is thickening. These are, this is a small blood vessel. And you see another blood vessel like this, and you see something like this. Okay. Which one is high line? Which one is hyperplastic? Which one is high line out of A and B? Simple, B is hyperplastic. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. So with, with, with this, we are done. Uh, Monkberg is not high yield. This is high yield. And these two pictures are very high yield. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay, so let's move forward to the next one. Let's talk about atherosclerosis. What is atherosclerosis? Atherosclerosis is one type of arteriosclerosis of large and medium sized arteries with formation of cholesterol plaques. Okay, with formation of cholesterol plaques. Does anyone know how? we get atherosclerosis? How do we get atherosclerosis? Okay, look. Um, one second. This is a blood vessel. Yes. Do you remember how I told you in the blood vessels, blood should always have a laminar flow? Okay. Now, there are two ways you can damage the, there are two ways that you can damage the blood vessel wall. Either instead of laminar flow, if the, if the blood becomes turbulent, <clears throat> can they disrupt the blood vessel wall? Yes or no? 
and cause endothelial injury. Okay, that's that's one. Number two, if someone's a smoker or they have been uh, having some sort of uh, drug or anything that is weakening the walls of the blood vessels, can this also predispose the patient to have endothelial injury? Right? Okay, so that's it. So what happens whenever we get endothelial injury, the body, the the body will try to fix it. Yes or no? Your system will they will try to fix the damage. With what do they fix the damage with? Carbon, uh, carbohydrate, protein, or fat? They fix the damage with fat or cholesterol. Okay, is it only cholesterol? The answer is no. First and foremost, whenever whenever we have a damage, there's a there's a cell that will directly come, right? If it's uh, acute damage, new neutrophils in chronic damage, which is usually the case, a cell that will come is macrophage. And macrophage, when it will come, macrophage will deposit. And along with macrophage, you will have deposition of lipids, right? You will have deposition of lipids. Whenever we have macrophage and deposition of lipids, further in the future, when blood goes through this thing over here, Will it also get more turbulent in the future? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So can we get extensions of atherosclerosis? They will keep on extending. The answer is yes. At one point, what, what happens is there is release of growth factors. This release of growth factors, they induce the proliferation of smooth muscle. So now you have three problems. You have lipid, macrophage, and smooth muscle that is obstructing your blood vessel. Along with this, worse come worse, the last thing that you would want is these things to get fibrosed. Because if this lipid, if this gets, if this gets fibrosed, then will it be difficult to remove this lipid, yes or no? The answer is yes. So if the patient does not inter is not receiving intervention or is a, if the patient is not changing their lifestyle, then the last thing that can damage your blood vessel and, and, and cause damage is fibrosis. Okay, are we clear, yes or no? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, yesterday, when I sent you guys a link, do you remember how I asked you who is um, Ali Suleiman, most probably, or Ahmed Suleiman, some sort? Did you guys read that message? There was a PS message down. Yes. Does anyone have any idea who this person is? Who the student is? Ahmed Suleiman. Okay. So basically, we received a transaction from a student. That's why I always ask you, whenever you perform your transactions, please write down your name. We received a trans transaction from a student. We do not know who the student is, which is causing a lot of confusion. So that's it. Okay, no problem. Let's move back into our text. Did you guys understand this one? Yes or no? Yes? This picture is very high yield. Please underline this. What is atherosclerosis? It's a very common disease of the elastic arteries and large medium-sized arteries. Location, you will receive questions about this. Underline this one. What is the most common location of atherosclerosis? Number one is abdominal aorta. They, want to, they would want to know this. Then coronary, then popliteal, then keratin. But this is high yield. Abdomen, abdominal aorta is number one. Okay, this is a high yield. This is asked in the questions. Risk factor wise, there are two types of risk factors modifiable, non modifiable. Modifiables are hypertension, smoking, and high cholesterol level and diabetes because diabetes will damage the blood vessel wall. Does anyone know how diabetes damages the blood vessel wall? This is a very high yield concept. How does diabetes damage blood vessel wall? Can anyone tell me? Let's see if anyone has any idea.
color of him. The blood vessel wall itself creates KW nodules. Uh, nope, KW nodules are created in the kidney. Okay, so that's not the correct answer, but thank you for trying. Glycosylation, okay. That's one way, another way. Blood vessels, <clears throat> are we aware that blood vessels itself are supplied by blood vessels? We call this vasa vasorum. Diabetes, in diabetes, what happens? There's glycosylation and there is damage of the small blood vessels. If there is damage of the blood vessels supplying the wall of the blood vessel, will this, for example, if this is damaged, will this portion get weak? Yes, as a result, is there an increased chance of endothelial injury or decreased chance of endothelial injury? There's a increased chance. So that's why, that's why diabetes is a major risk factor, but it's modifiable. If you control your sugar, then you will not have atherosclerosis. Non-modifiable are obviously age because you cannot change your age. Males are more predisposed, uh, males are more at risk of developing diabetes, okay? Postmenopausal status, <laughs> females. So the reason why females are not um, predisposed to atherosclerosis is because of the female hormone, estrogen. They protect the blood vessels. Right after menopause, does estrogen fall? Yes or no? The answer is yes. That's why postmenopausal women are more at risk. Okay. And family history of heart of any atherosclerosis. That's that. What are the symptoms? Symptoms could be angina. What is angina? Angina is increased pain with increased workload. Okay, that makes sense, right? Right. For example, if this is the blood vessels which was atheros, which was sclerosed, and this blood vessel is supplying your heart right? If the heart has to function more, does it need more blood? The answer is yes. But if there's a block, can the blood go? The answer is no. As a result, what would happen? Will there be enough oxygen? The answer is no. As a result, what would happen? You would get anaerobic metabolism. From that, we will get lactic acid. Lactic acid will disrupt the pH pH will de uh, de uh, decrease pH, will break down arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid breakdown will result in prostaglandin and bradykinin. Prostaglandin and bradykinin will activate the alpha receptors of free nerve ending. These are your pain receptors. These pain receptors, where will they go? They will go all the way to the, what? To the brain in the somatosensory cortex, and we will experience what chest pain. This is basically the pathway of chest pain. Very simple, yes or no? Yes, okay. Did you guys understand this? Yes or no? Did I go too fast? Do you want me to repeat myself? This is very simple. There is an obstruction. I need you guys to help me out. If I have to repeat myself, then please give me a faster feedback. Just write yes or no. Okay. Just write yes or no. <clears throat> Heart, yes or no? Okay. Okay, this is the heart. This is the blood vessel supplying the heart. Okay, this is not pulmonary trunk. For example, this is a blood vessel. Let's say this is coronary artery. I'm just magnifying it for your understanding purpose. Mm -hmm. If there is a block in the coronary artery and the heart and you start to run, Will you need more blood in the heart? Yes or no? Yes. So blood tries to come, but can it come because of the block? The answer is no. As a result, <laughs> oxygen 
in the ventricular muscle? Is it high or is it low? It falls. When oxygen falls, what type of metabolism will the muscle conduct, aerobic or anaerobic? Anaerobic. In anaerobic metabolism, do we get ATP or do we get lactic acid? We get ATP and lactic acid, as a matter of fact, but we get more lactic acid. This lactic acid, what will it do to the pH? Will it increase the pH or decrease the pH? Decrease the pH. If the pH decreases in the plasma membranes of the cardiac muscles, arachidonic acid will get broken down, yes or no? Under the influence of decreased pH, they get broken down to prostaglandin and bradykinin, yes or no? Prostaglandins and bradykinins, yes? Prostaglandins, especially prostaglandins. Prostaglandins and bradykinins, can they bind to the pain receptors? Pain receptors. Pain receptors are called free nerve endings. Free nerve endings. Are they going to bind to the free nerve endings? Yes or no? Yes. Will this, will this stimulate the free nerve endings? This free nerve endings, this simulation, where do we feel sensation? The sensation of pain. Where do we feel this? Do we feel this? We feel this in the somatosensory cortex. Yes. And we try to localize the pain. This is the mechanism of anginal pain. Okay. Or any pain in the body, as a matter of fact, due to decreased blood supply. Okay, are we clear now? Yes or no? Okay. Now, let's move forward. What is or how does atherosclerosis take place? I already talked about this. I'm not going to talk about this anymore. This is the pathology of this one. Endothelial injury, macrophage palm, lipid gets deposited, more endothelial injury results in release of growth factors that causes depositions of smooth muscle. What are the names of the growth factors? There is fibroblast growth factor and platelet derived growth factors, PTGF. Okay, so that's it. Are we clear, yes or no? What are some complications of atherosclerosis? Aneurysms means ballooning dilatation because of weakening of the blood vessel. Ischemia due to less blood supply, infarction due to less blood supply, peripheral vascular diseases, for example, uh, blockage of peripheral arteries, that's what we mean by peripheral vascular disease, thrombus, right, formation of thrombus that is blocked and breaking of that thrombus and releasing that thrombus into the bloodstream results in an emboli, very simple. These are not important, you will not get questions asked like this. The questions are over here with the star marks. This is a question. Then this is a question, risk factor. And this, patho this pathology is a question. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Now, next one is aortic aneurysm, very high yield. Aortic aneurysm is very, very high yield. First and foremost, what is an aneurysm? Okay, first and foremost, what is an aneurysm? Okay, this is a normal blood vessel. In this normal blood vessel, blood is flowing like this, right? For any reason, if there is weakness of the walls of the blood vessels due to smoking, due to diabetes, due to connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome, it could be due to um, aging or normal aging process or any sort of, for example, if there's an atherosclerosis here, then there'll be increased pressure over here that can also injure the blood vessel. For whatever reason, 
in the presence of an endothelial injury, if the blood vessels under the influence of high blood flow dilate and have this pathological ballooning appearance, right? They have this pathological ballooning appearance. This ballooning is called an aneurysm. Very simple. What is the problem with having an aneurysm? The problem with having an aneurysm is that at any point, the aneurysm can break. And if it breaks or ruptures, all the arterial blood will start to drain out. If it starts to drain out, are we going, are we going to be in a big problem? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Why? Because arterial pressure is very high. This is flowing at the rate of 120 over 80. That means that they will get out at the rate of 120 over 80. So will it take a lot of time for us to lose blood? No. Will we die? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. So uh, is it more dangerous to have aneurysms in small arteries or is it more dangerous to have aneurysms in large arteries? Which one? It's more dangerous to have aneurysms in large arteries. Because in large arteries, there is a much larger blood flow. Much larger blood flow means a much faster blood loss, as simple as that. So that's that. So uh, what are some of the, I mean, the two regions where aneurysms are very common is, if this is the heart, and what is the name of this blood vessel that's coming out from the left ventricle? Aorta. The aorta that stays in the thoracic cavity, what is the name of this aorta? This is thoracic aorta, as simple as that. The aorta as it goes down and it reaches the abdomen, what is the name of this aorta? Abdominal aorta, very simple. So if we get aneurysms in this region, if we get aneurysms in this region and this region, are we going to be in big trouble? Yes or no? The answer is? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so what are the risk factors? There could be multiple risk factors. I mentioned a lot of them. First and foremost, there is smoking, diabetes, obesity, age, hypertension, uh, Martin syndrome, everything else. Another one that's very high yield, especially for this one, for thoracic aneurysm, is cardiocephalus. Do you remember yesterday I told you that cardiocephalus can cause aortic regurgitation? Yes or no? Do you know how? Let me tell you how. Let me tell, then let me tell you how. This is the ascending aorta. This is the aortic valve. The aortic valve is being sub held back by corda tendini, which are being supplied by small blood vessels, right? Syphilis, they come and they cause inflammation of these small blood vessels, something that we call as and arteritis, arteritis. When they cause inflammation, there's decreased blood supply. And as a result, what happens? There is weakening of the valves and the valves, they regurgitate downwards. Same way, same way as vasovasorum, very good. Same way, syphilis in the thoracic aorta, they cause end arteritis, arterial inflammation of the vasovasorum and they weaken the wall. When they weaken the wall, we get aneurysms. Are we clear? Okay, so that's that. It's usually associated with atherosclerosis. Risk factors are here. Most often, it's infrarenal. This is high yield. Please underline this. Infrarenal means below the renal artery. This one is associated with cystic medial degeneration. If this is more associated with cystic medial degeneration, a patient of Marfan syndrome, should they have an increased prevalence of this one, abdomen or thoracic aortic aneurysm? Which one? This is very high yield. Thoracic aortic aneurysm is very high yield in Marfan syndrome and tertiary syphilis. And also tertiary syphilis can cause aortic regurgitation. 
Are we clear? Yes or no? <clears throat> Everyone, are, are we clear or not? Yes or no? Okay. Now let's move on to traumatic aortic rupture. Let's move on to traumatic aortic rupture. So, uh, so far, have we understood the lecture? Quick questions, quick feedbacks. Is the pace of the lecture okay? No. Are you guys understanding the concepts? Yes, okay, so good. Okay, I know that Dr. S, you have a question regarding um, squatting and uh, increase of afterload. I'll explain you this concept one more time after the lecture ends. For now, are we ready to start this page? Yes or no? Okay, let's begin. So far, we have talked about what would happen if there is an arterial damage and we get ballooning. Yes? Now, we are going to talk about another condition. Okay, let me just draw the condition. Okay, what's happening over here? What is the name of this blood vessel? Hey, order. Are you sure? Yes or no? Yes. Of course you're sure. Okay. What else could this be? So my question to you guys is, let's say that this is uh, the aorta, right? Uh, this is a normal aorta. I'm just using a thicker, red color to help you understand that the aorta or any other artery, they have what? They have layers. How many layers? Three layers. Cunica media, cunica intima, cunica adventitia. Okay. Now, there is an issue. Let me tell you what the issue is. The issue is in a patient who has extreme hypertension, the blood is getting out at a rate of more than, let's say, 140 by 90 for a long period of time. So let's say a patient is suffering from hypertension for 10 years. Will there be multiple aneurysms and weakenings of the blood vessel? Yes. At any one point, we are aware that they can break, that's fine. But can there be another problem? What is that problem? Isn't there a possibility that this high blood will tear into the blood vessel? And as a result, the blood will flow in between the blood vessel wall, in between these walls. Isn't that a possibility? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Meaning that, meaning that this high blood pressure is dissecting. This is dissecting the arterial wall. So if this is the arterial wall, then blood is not only going through this way, it's also going in between the arterial walls. Is that dangerous or not dangerous? That is very, very dangerous, yes? So if a patient of hypertension comes to you with a sudden onset of chest pain and severe tearing, isn't, this, isn't the blood tearing the blood vessel? Yes, or wall, yes or no? The answer is yes. 
they're tearing the blood vessel wall. If there's a severe chest pain associated with a tearing, tearing pain in the back, what is our provisional diagnosis? Our provisional diagnosis is aortic dissection. How many types of aortic dissection are there and which one needs immediate intervention and which one needs or does not need immediate intervention? Then this is the question. Question is, I mean, the answer is there are two types of aortic dissection. Number one is called Stanford A. Another one is called Stanford B. What is Stanford A? Okay. Stanford A, I'm not going to draw it anymore. Stanford A is the aortic dissection occurs, occurs along the arch of aorta over here. And then it moves down. Okay. In Stanford A, we have two types. One is the dissection will happen here. That is type B. And if the dissection happens here and it starts moving down, then we call this type A. Are we clear about Stanford? Um, my, my apologies. My apologies. Just give, just give me one second. I, I missed, I missed, I mixed this up. Okay, one more time. In Stanford type A, in Stanford type A, this is uh, aortic dissection that will happen at the arch of aorta. This is type A. Okay, in type A, if it happens in this region, we call it type A romantic two, like this one. If it happens over here and it goes down, we call this type A romantic one. Are we clear, yes or no? And about this information? First and foremost, if Stanford type if aortic dissection happens at the arch of aorta, what do we call this? Type A or type B? If it happens at the arch of aorta, this is type A, very simple. If it happens over here and it does not move down, then is it type two or type one? This is type two. If it moves down, then is it type one or type two? This is type one, but still we're talking about Stanford A. Now let's talk about Stanford B. Stanford B is the aortic dissection that will happen distal to the arch of aorta. Type A is proximal to the arch of aorta. Type B is distal. So type B will start, instead of starting from here, they'll start from here, okay? And there are no, there are no subclassifications of this one. Okay, so that's it. Now, the question is, which one is more dangerous, type A or type B? Now, let's think from a physics point of view. Let's, let's think from a, before you answer this question, let's think from a physics point of view, from a physics point of view. If there's a damage here and there's a damage here, the blood over here is going up against gravity and the blood over here is coming down towards gravity. Which one has an additional force, B or A? Which one has an additional force? Gravity is pulling this way How does A have an additional force? In A, blood is moving this way, gravity is pulling this way. So the pressure in A is less or more? The pressure in A is less or more? How is the pressure in A more? How? How is the pressure in A more? Why are you saying more? If gravity is working this way and the blood is going this way, the gravity will make sure that, that the pressure is less, yes or no? And if the blood is moving this way and the gravity is also pulling this way, 
once again, the pressure is higher in which condition, A or B? The gravity, it's in B. So the progression of damage will be more in which condition, Stanford type A or Stanford type B? So which one needs immediate attention? Okay, Stanford type B will, if there's a Stanford type B damage, it will need immediate attention. But the question is, okay, but the question is, for which type of damage will you go for surgery? The thing is, in Stanford type B, what would happen? Exactly, in Stanford type B, in Stanford B, it needs immediate attention but we can solve it by giving beta blockers and vasodilator. In Stanford type A, what would happen? In Stanford type A, okay, the ascending aorta is receiving the maximum amount of blood coming up. It's working against gravity. So in Stanford type A, if you give beta blockers and the vasodilators, will it actually help? Yes or no? The answer is not as much. So in Stanford type A, we, we are going to go for surgery. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? So the question is, one more time, in aortic dissection, which one needs immediate surgery? Which one needs... Uh, to be treated immediately. The, the thing is Stanford type B needs to be treated immediately with medications such as beta blockers and vasodilators. And then Stanford type A, since the blood is coming out from the heart, beta blockers and vasodilators will not work. So type A needs immediate surgery. Okay, so that's it. This is the aortic dissection. This picture is extremely high yield for your exam. This shows that there is a break. Yes, there you go. What is the aortic dissection? It's a longitudinal tear. It's associated with hypertension, can present with tearing, sudden onset chest pain, radiating to the back. This is what will be, uh, this is how the, the patient will be describing your question. Can result in organ ischemia, Stanford type A and Stanford type B. Stanford type A, involves ascending aorta that is proximal. Stanford type B affects descending aorta that is distal. Which one is more dangerous? Stanford type B is more dangerous, but we can treat it with beta blocker and vasodilators. And type A cannot be treated with uh, beta blockers and vasodilators, so it needs to be treated with surgery, as simple as that. It may result in acute aortic regurgitation or cardiac tamponade, that's another one. Okay, so that's that. Are we clear? Yes or no? One more thing. One more thing. Um, if this is the heart, this is the cavity of the heart. This is the artery that's coming out of the heart. If there is a tear over here in Stanford type A, in Stanford type A, if there's a tear, can blood come out and deposit in the cardiac chamber? Yes. Can we get cardiac tamponade? Okay. So one more time, extent of damage is higher in A or in B. Extent of damage is higher in B because of gravity. But complications are higher in A or in B. Complications are higher in A. Okay. So can we say that in your U.S. Assembly step one, there will be a question where patients will come to you with sudden onset of tearing chest pain. Now the patient has jugular venous distension, 
high pull, <coughs> hypotension. And what is the third thing of Beck's triad? Can anyone tell me? Can we get muffled heart sounds? Yes. So if there's a patient who comes to you with sudden onset of severe, severe tearing chest pain and back pain with hypertension and Beck's triad, is this Stanford type A or Stanford type B? This is Stanford type A. Are we clear, yes or no? Next question is, if there's a patient who comes to you with sudden onset of severe tearing chest pain and back pain with hypertension, now has jugular venous distension, hypotension, muffled heart sound, you do an X-ray, in the X-ray you see wide mediastinum. The aortic dissection is proximal to the arch of aorta or distal to the arch of aorta, fast answers please. Okay, so one more time. Patient comes to you with, let me try to hear the question and concentrate. Patient comes to you with sudden onset of severe chest pain, back pain. Nature of the pain is a tearing pain. Now the patient has jugular venous distension, hypotension, and muffled heart sound. Is the dissection proximal to the arch or distal to the arch. Why? Because this is a Stanford type A. Okay. Are we going to make the same mistake again when we solve our questions, yes or no? Okay, thank you so much. Next one is, if blood is flowing out in between the blood vessel walls, right? If blood is flowing out in between the blood vessel walls, can we get unequal blood pressure in both arms? Can we get unequal blood pressures in both, both, both arms? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Can we get ischemia, organ ischemia? Yes or no? Yes. Can we get hypotensive shock? Yes or no? The answer is yes. How do we diagnose aortic dissection? Can we do a immediate CT scan? Yes or no? Uh, yes. And if the patient is symptomatic, are you going to wait for CT scan or are you going to diagnose the patient based on examination history and chest x-ray? In chest x-ray, you'll see a wide media style. Okay, this is for step two, not step one. But I'm just saying this. I think it's for your understanding purpose. Okay, so for today, I think we have had enough. Tomorrow we'll begin our lecture from over here. Are we clear, yes or no? Yes, okay. Uh, okay, Dr. S, do I, do I have Dr. S, your attention? Your question was, how does squatting help in increase the afterload in a patient of TOF, TOF? In a patient of tetralogy of Fallot, we have ventricular septal defect and pulmonary stenosis. As a result, instead of blood going to this way, right, blood goes this way to the ascending aorta. And this blood is deoxygenated blood. So deoxygenated blood reaching the systemic circulation, does the patient get hypoxic? Fast answers, please. The answer is yes. Yes or no? Yes. When they get hypoxic, they will squat down. They will squat down. When they squat, the pressure over here is high. Yes or no? Yes, as a result, now the blood, instead of going this way, can it start to flow back to this way? Yes, and can it go to the lungs now? 
Yes. If it goes through the lungs, does the patient have uh, does the patient have uh, improvement of his or her sign symptoms? Yes. Can I get a yes or a no, please, so that I know you have understood or you did not understand? In that way, I'll repeat myself. Yes. So did you understand this or do you want me to repeat this again? Okay, good. Thank you so much. Okay, could you repeat why aortic dissection, uh, the patient can present with unequal blood pressure in arms? Yes, of course. If there's, if there's an aortic dissection, let's say that this is the arch of the aorta. This is the brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid, left subclavian. If the dissection is, is over here, if the dissection is over here, right? Uh, if the dissection is over here, will the left subclavian get more blood or the right subclavian will it get more blood? The answer is the right subclavian will get the blood properly because there is no problem. The left, sub, the left subclavian will not get the blood properly because the blood is flowing out of the blood vessels. As a result, blood pressure in the right arm will be one and the blood pressure in the another arm will be different. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Tomorrow is which day is tomorrow? Tomorrow is Does anyone know the answer to this question? Which day is tomorrow? Friday. And do we have anyone over here from my previous batch, from our previous batch, who knows what Friday is for us? What Friday is for us is? Okay. Friday is a holiday. Okay. So what is the best way to celebrate a holiday? By an exam. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay, are we happy? Okay, we all want exams. Yes, okay. Okay, so Friday exams. Tomorrow there's an exam. That is, this exam is very, very important. How important is this? This is, this is so important that I will assess your performance. And not only me, you will assess your own performance and you'll see how much you're concentrating in the class. Okay. So what is the exam on? The exam on the exam is on entire endocrinology and CVS, embryology, physiology. Are we clear? Yes. CVS, embryology, physiology, and anatomy. Okay. So since we have an exam tomorrow, today we are not going to do any more questions. That means I need you guys to practice questions at home and go through first aid at home. Tomorrow the exam is how long? I mean, does anyone have any idea? As the exam is very good, one hour. We have 40 questions, one block. Passing mark is, I'm gonna increase the passing mark to 25. If you do not score 25, then you really have to study first aid again, okay? And I know you guys are not doing your homeworks properly, which is uh, contradictory. Some might say it's okay, some might say it's not, but I would really prefer if you can do the homework. If you do the homework, then everything will be very easy for everyone. Okay, any more questions before I sign off for today?
Okay, Dr. VK, no more questions. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, Dr. Ellen, thank you so much. Dr. Fidel, you're welcome. Dr. Jorge, welcome. Okay, Fidel, you're welcome. Thank you. Welcome to everyone. And thank you for putting your time and attention and your uh, trust in our lectures. Um, please try to make sure that you read the text every day. Okay, Dr. S, you're welcome. Please try to make sure that you read the text every day. Okay, so Dr. S has a question. In fetus with PDA blood flow normally is from right to left. Uh, initially it's from right to left, then it later changes from left to right. Well, the pressure on the left side is more, okay? After birth, it will change from, yes, left to right, okay? okay. So once again, thank you so much for putting your attention in the class. Make sure that you read the text properly. When you read the text, you'll find out that there are some things which you might or might not have understood. It's not clear. When it's not clear, bring it up in the class. I'll explain it. Uh, if you do not want to read the text, that's okay. Make sure that you concentrate in the class so well that you do not have to read the text at home anymore. If you have any questions, you can ask me directly in the class, number one. Number two is in the in your own time, I need you to make sure and make sure that you guys are doing the three things to pass your step one. This is U F A P. U for U world. F A for first aid. E for Potoma. These are the three pillars of step one. We are doing this right now. In at your own time, make sure that you do this and this. If you do not do them, then you then you will have very big problems. Okay. Petoma is very important. Okay, so can I sign off right now? Does anyone have any more questions? Does anyone have any more questions? No. So have a great day and I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. We'll start with some lecture and then we'll have our exam. Okay, bye-bye now.